All right, so we've discussed some of the theories on motivation in just a general sense. Now we're going to delve a little bit deeper and more specific into uh, more nuanced areas of motivation like hunger. And later on we'll go into work and achievement motivation. So within hunger, it's important to recognize that there are all different kinds of factors that play a role, much like what we talked about in the intro to motivation notes. You've got biological factors, cognitive factors, social factors. So let's get into it. When we're dealing with the physical, of what physically triggers hunger, biologically you've got three key components. You have the stomach contractions. Those are those awkward stomach pangs that you feel when it starts to kind of rumble and get upset and let you know that you're hungry. Those are actually contractions that are happening. You also have body chemistry, and that deals with the amount of blood sugar that's going on, your glucose levels. And then you have the hypothalamus that's involved. We're coming back and we're bringing some priorly uh, taught information back into the fold when discussing this particular piece. So let's talk stomach contractions first, go a little more in depth. As I said, those pangs, that discomfort that you feel when your stomach starts kind of gnawing at itself, that is meant to send a signal to your brain to let it know, hey, we are aware of our hunger, okay? This is meant to be a kind of brutal in your face heads up that you need to get some food in you for a reason. Walter Cannon and A.L. Washburn are those gentlemen who ended up studying the physiology of these stomach contractions. We're, you're going to hear Walter Cannon's name again later on. He is pretty influential in some of the emotion theories that we discuss. So Washburn, as his associate, ends up swallowing a balloon that will end up settling in his stomach. And that was used to measure his stomach contractions. And while he would experience those contractions, anytime he would feel hungry, he would press a key that was connected to a computerized system to try to compute all of these various different experiences that Washburn was having. And as you can see here, his uh, mouth was connected. And so that was the way that they were able to get the balloon down into the stomach and be able to remove it later on so that way he wouldn't end up digesting the balloon as well during this whole process. Second piece then is your blood sugar level, your glucose. Your body is usually very good at maintaining your blood glucose levels, but when you're hungry, there's a physical change that happens. Insulin, a hormone that's released by your pancreas, ends up decreasing glucose in your blood. And so once that lowering of the glucose levels happens, it makes us feel hungry. You get the, the stomach contractions that kind of signal later on saying, hey, you know, you need to get some food into you. So it's this body chemistry change that occurs that also lets us know that we need to get something in us. We don't consciously notice this particular change. It's not like what happens with our stomach when there is a very, very noticeable discomfort and unpleasantness that happens. So where this glucose body change comes into play is sending signals to the brain, to the hypothalamus. There are neurons, sensory receptors in your stomach, liver, and intestines, all of which are involved in food digestive processes, that send the signals to the brain that glucose levels are low, we need to eat something. And so that's where this particular brain structure comes into play. There are two key centers in your hypothalamus that revolve around food and hunger. You have the lateral hypothalamus and the ventromedial hypothalamus. So within this brain structure that involves our survival drives, because it also deals with thirst and uh, sex drive as well, in addition to maintaining body temperature, the lateral hypothalamus brings on and initiates hunger. So this is what signals to us that we need to eat something. Interestingly enough, if the lateral hypothalamus is damaged or lesioned in any way in animals, they're gonna starve to death. They will stop eating because their brain is not signaling to them, hey, you need to eat so they don't feel hunger so therefore they don't eat anything and they just end up losing a lot of weight as a result and starving. On the flip side of this, you've got the ventromedial hypothalamus and this stops our hunger. So this is what tells us that we've eaten enough, we're good. It's what makes us feel full. 
if you damage the ventromedial hypothalamus, or you lesion this in animals, they're going to over eat and end up causing themselves a world full of health problems due to obesity basically. So you can see this little mouse right down here it is so cute and chunky but it is very very much heavily influenced by the lack of his ventromedial hypothalamus. It was lesioned and so because his brain didn't have the ability to send signals to him to say stop eating he just ate and ate and ate and ate and ate and ate and ate. So we know when we've eaten too much or we don't need to continue eating, we've gotten enough food in our stomachs. When we get that discomfort and that level of feeling very full, that is our ventromedial hypothalamus letting us know we can stop eating. So good way to be able to help us differentiate between these two. This was something that always helped me. Ventromedial sounds like vomit or at least it's start, they both start with the letter V. So you feel sometimes if you've eaten too, too much, like you're gonna get physically sick and kind of throw it all back up. So ventromedial sounds like vomit. Ventromedial hypothalamus is the one that lets us know that we're full and we've eaten too much. So next piece to this in our discussion of hunger motivation is the theory behind how we end up altering various points of our body chemistry and weight physiologically. So this is set point theory. This argues that manipulation of your lateral and ventromedial hypothalamus ends up changing and altering your body's weight thermostat as they call it. And so this ends up predisposing us to keeping our bodies at a very steady set point. For the vast majority of individuals, unless extenuating circumstances don't kind of come into play, so for example stress, depression, uh, issues going on in your personal life, most of us will maintain a steady body weight for a fairly extensive period of time. When we want to alter that body weight, we have to do certain things, and our body will respond in kind. So if you've ever heard of anyone attempting to lose weight, there ends up being this issue of what they call a plateau, the spot that you end up hitting that after a certain period of weight loss, you just can't seem to go any further or faster in your weight loss than that. And they believe much of that goes to the set point theory. If weight is lost because you've gone below your set point or your steady weight, your food intake needs to increase and your energy expenditure needs to decrease in order to maintain that set, steady set weight. So your body starts to kind of have alarm bells going off. You're losing weight, you're losing body fat. It perceives that as an emergency kind of situation. And so as a result, what it's gonna do is it's gonna lower your metabolism and lower your energy expenditure so that way you can hold on to that weight and kind of try to put a little bit more back onto you. So if you've ever watched The Biggest Loser before, this is a, a show that is fairly popular and this situation comes into play kind of frequently. The contestants on that show will kind of hit a point where they have to um, very much alter their expenditure of energy to adjust that set point that seems to be involved. Now on the flip side of this, if weight is gained, if you go above the set point, what is happening is that the um, food intake is, you know, what you need to do to kind of offset that and get yourself back to a steady weight, you need to decrease the food intake, you need to stop eating, so to some extent that would involve in some circles dieting, and your energy expenditures need to increase, so you need to exercise. So this is why a lot of times people argue that diet alone is not necessarily going to help you and exercising alone is not necessarily going to help you. You need to be careful in watching both. To maintain your set point, what has to happen is the body adjusts both the food intake and the energy output just like we said, but it also has to adjust your basal metabolic rate or your BMR. Many of you, if you've ever taken health class, you have heard of this term before. This is your body's resting rate of energy expenditure. So by that, what we mean in that technical term, to make it a little bit easier to understand, it's the minimum amount of calories that you need to take in in a day in order for your body to not lose any weight, okay? 
So, but to do so at the most basic of levels. So if you're very sedentary, you don't expend a whole lot of energy, you're going to have a lower BMR because your body doesn't need a whole lot of energy or calories to help it spend through that. On the flip side of things, if you are a very active person, your BMR, your lower, your, you know, that minimum level of energy expenditure is going to be a little higher because you need to have a certain amount of calories built in for that high metabolism to maintain that steady weight. Now, as is always going to be the case with many of the theories that we discuss, there are pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses. One of the big holes for those that believe in set point theory is that slow and sustained changes to body weight can alter your set point. And so as a result, there is fluctuation in this piece. So if we go back, maintaining a steady weight here, it just staying straight across the board, isn't necessarily going to happen if you just do very slow and sustained alterations to things. So we'll go back to the biggest loser example here. This is not instantaneous, immediate alterations to these people's uh, body weights and energy expenditures. They, they very steadily increase them toward certain amounts of exercise and certain amounts of dieting and caloric intake cutoffs. So small changes over a longer period of time can end up altering a set point. So if that's the case, then a set point doesn't exist if there are changes to it. So now we got to talk about cognitive and social factors that play into motivation and hunger. External incentives tend to pull us toward e eating, even if we are not particularly hungry. So let's say you're sitting in third bell and you don't necessarily feel hungry, but a student brings in cookies. Purely by presiding that and presenting it in front of you and providing it to you, you feel a desire to eat it. So you do. And in that case, then you are motivated to carry out a particular action with regard to your hunger, even though it's not there. Eating by the clock has a tendency to happen too. Many of you guys just practically keel over at the thought of having to have a later lunch. Um, if you get, you know, one of our fourth or fifth lunches, students complain all the time about how hungry they are because, you know, it's time to eat by a certain point. Many of us often during the summers, I'm sure, you will sleep later. So you'll get up 10, 30, 11 o'clock and you will eat your breakfast then. But an hour later, it's 12, 30, 1 o'clock and that's perceived to be the time that we eat lunch normally. So you'll eat again, even though you're not necessarily feeling any hunger pangs. Social eating is present too. Super Bowl ads uh, oftentimes have a tendency to be incredibly popular and the Super Bowl itself is. And a lot of times people get together with one another to eat lots of stuff and to watch that football game and to watch those commercials. Sometimes people will admit that they watch the commercials more so than they do the game itself. And this experience is meant to be just an excuse for people to get together and have a whole bunch of food, even if you're not, again, uh, feeling any level of hunger. Stress and depression play a role here. These are two very important cognitive factors. There are people out there, it's called emotional eating, where if they're very, very stressed out and there's a lot of stuff going on that's overwhelming, they will eat and eat and eat and eat and eat to deal with that. On the flip side of things, if you have depression, oftentimes there is a lack of hunger. Many people who are depressed tend to not feel a desire to eat because of all of the different things that are going on in their head to, to kind of make them feel overwhelmed with the disorder that they're dealing with. And so they tend to not eat all that much as a result. And then you have other eating cues, just like the holidays. We're in the midst of those right now. And so many people, again, have a tendency to get together with one another, go to holiday celebrations, have parties. And so there are foods that are out and on display and ready for people to enjoy. And so that ends up incentivizing them to eat even when they don't want to. Then you have the cultural factors. This is food that is, and I did say food, presented at street markets, open air markets in Beijing, China. This is stuff people can buy to eat. You have scorpion on a skewer. You have some very, very, very large crickets here. You've got beetles. Uh, so 
Mmm, really tasty looking to someone in a different culture, maybe. In the United States, we would take one look at this and we would have no desire to want to eat it at all, for the most part. Fear factor became popular because it required people to eat things like this, stuff that we perceive to be gross and unappetizing. Now, if I were to replace this picture with something like burgers or pizza, or, uh, you know, something that you particularly enjoy, Chipotle, then you'd perceive it as appetizing because culturally speaking, that's how we perceive it to be appetizing. And so that ends up influencing whether or not you're willing to eat it. Now on to eating disorders. This is definitely something that needs to be discussed within this realm of hunger motivation purely just because many of these end up altering hunger patterns. The first one to discuss is anorexia nervosa. That's a technical term. Most people just know it as anorexia. This is characterized by people who are normal weight, and I cannot stress that enough. This is not a scenario of those who are overweight. This person is of normal structure, but they perceive that they are overweight. And so, usually this is adolescent women, although we've seen a staggering rise in this in men and teenage boys losing dramatic amounts of weight and still feeling too heavy. So I have these two images here. This is a woman who dealt with and struggled with anorexia, starved herself, did not eat, and still perceived herself to be too overweight even at this stick thin level. This young lady here, this is uh, an Olsen twin. She was on the, uh, she was on Full House, for those of you guys that watch it on Nick at Night. It makes me feel really old to mention that on Nick at Night because I used to watch that when I was really little. She struggled with anorexia. She would end up starving herself and perceived herself to be overweight and heavy, despite the fact that she very clearly was not. Now, on the flip side of this, you have bulimia nervosa, or bulimia as it's most widely known. This is characterized by what they call binging and purging. So the binging is overeating, very high calorie foods. They will just eat, excuse me, eat and eat and eat and eat and feel high levels of guilt for that, have concern that they're going to gain weight. And so as a result, what happens is that guilt compels them to vomit it or purge it out of them uh, by either uh, throwing it all back up or using a laxative to get it all out of their system or they will respond by the overeating with fasting or excessive exercise. So this is a kind of continuous cycle that happens. They eat too much, they feel guilty, so they try to get it out of their system and they will fast for an extensive period of time or overly exercise to counteract that issue. With bulimia, this is not going to be a scenario of losing weight necessarily. The issue is gaining weight from the overeating that happens. So that's an important differentiation between this and anorexia. Also along with this, you have binge eating. This kind of couples a little bit more with uh, what I was referencing with that emotional eating. People who just have a tendency to overeat. Um, as a result of various different emotional or cognitive issues that are going on or personal factors in their family or just personal life in general. So binge eating is basically um, the first part of bulimia, that overeating piece. It's just not followed by the purging. So people with binge eating disorders have a tendency to end up gaining a decent amount of weight as a result of those recurring actions. Now, when we're discussing this issue of hunger and, uh, and eating disorders, social cultural pieces come into play, particularly in Western cultures. As I said, we're noticing a very strong rise in the diagnosis of kind of what we call body dysmorphic disorders for men, so very distorted perceptions of body image. But for the most part, women in particular seem most heavily affected by eating disorders. Western culture tends to overemphasize thinner body images than really any other culture out there. 
so the cultures that put more emphasis on appearance have a tendency to have higher rates of eating disorders. So it makes sense then that we have that correlation, but note that's not causation, between women in the United States having a fairly high number of uh, eating disorders. So this is something to kind of help you just to kind of see how body image very much plays a role. So that cognitive, that perspective of yourself, how you think of yourself um, in lending itself toward the possibility of eating disorders. So on this scale, you have thinnest down here at two, fattest down here. What a woman, what a woman, excuse me, has a tendency to perceive herself at is kind of toward the heavier side of things. What women believe men prefer is closer to skinnier, and what a woman's ideal is even skinnier than a man's happens to be. But what men actually prefer is actually is just kind of right here, slightly toward the middle. So women perceive that men want them to be really, really skinny, but in actuality, that isn't what men's preferred body type happens to be. So when you hear that mentality of people being their own worst critic, that really does have a tendency to play out, particularly when it comes to hunger motivation. So to summarize all of this and wrap it up into a nice, pretty little package, this is a biopsychosocial approach. We've discussed this from unit one, that for the most part, modern psychology argues that there are biological factors, psychological factors, sociocultural factors that all interact with one another to lead to the behavior that's being studied. So you have aspects like the hypothalamus involved, glucose levels, hormones, stomach pangs. Those all interact with, let's say, your mood, um, the sight or smell of certain foods, and that ends up involving some sociocultural factors because the sight of one food, like carrots, might not necessarily be terribly appetizing to somebody who kind of is a junk food addict and really, really, really likes chips instead. So all of those pieces interact to, to explain the particular behavior that they've been talking about. So it's the end of our discussion of, at least, hunger patients. So we'll go back to the class with one another, but as you have any questions, feel free to ask.